Hey everyone, happy First Chapter Friday. Today we're going to be reading Dear Sweet Pea by Julie Murphy. Chapter one, the cat's out of the box. I've counted my birthday savings three times and at this rate, I don't think I'll ever have enough money to clone myself. I guess it doesn't help that cloning people isn't really a thing yet. Trust me, if it was, my mom would have already taken me in to make an identical model. One for her, one for dad. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But since there can only be one sweet pea, my parents have decided that the next best way to deal with their divorce is to have two houses. Two completely separate houses on the same street that look just about as identical as two different houses could. Similar paint and rugs and even furniture. Mom gets the original and dad gets the dupe, which makes sense since the old house belonged to Nana, mom's mom, before she died. I've spent a lot of time thinking about which of my things to take to dad's house, but I'm what Mrs. Young calls a visual learner. So this morning, Oscar Rivera, my best and only friend, and I took an old roll of dad's blue painter's tape and split my room in two. It reminds me of the blue line down the middle of the gym that Coach Jeffers uses for dodgeball, which, if you ask me, is even crueler than the section on rope climbing we did last fall. Not only do your classmates have a popularity death match picking teams, but then they get to peg you with rubber balls too. Hopefully packing up my room won't be quite as traumatic. What's your mom gonna say when she comes home and finds your room like this? Oscar asks, his shiny black hair swirled into a perfect mold using his latest discovery from the drugstore, Pomade, a sticky hair product that comes in a glass jar and Oscar swears is a miracle. I shrug as I take a second to process the damage. My room looks like someone came in, came in with a giant eraser and just wiped away half of the whole place, leaving the other side in its usual state of perfectly organized mess. Unmade bed, mismatching socks stuffed under the bed, and stacks of old homework and newspaper clippings piled up on my nightstand. I won't be home to find out. It's dad's night. Since there are only seven days in a week, Every other week, mom and dad take turns with who gets me for three nights and who gets four. Mom says it's imperative that neither of them is perceived as the dominant parent. But if you ask me, all you have to do to figure out which of my parents is in charge is ask yourself who's making the rules to begin with. If you guessed mom, ding, 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 you're right. I split the books by alphabetical order. Mom's house gets A through M and dad's house gets the rest. The division of all my other belongings was much slower and more snoozeworthy. But Oscar constantly reminds me, if I ever need anything, I'll be two houses down the street, separated only by Miss Flora May's hulking two-story house. At least you didn't cut the sheets in half, he says and reaches down for a box with sweet peas desk stuff scrawled across the side. Lift with your knees, I say mimicking what I've heard Mr. McMullen shout at his employees from behind his desk at Lowe's Hardware. I wasn't built for grunt work, says Oscar, as he heads for the door. You got the last box? Yep, see you over there. I squat down to tape the flaps of the final box shut before standing, doing my best to lift with my knees. What does that even mean anyway? And why did I cram so much stuff in this box? But then, just as I steady myself, a growling meow vibrates from inside the box. Holy crud! I snap and drop it on the rug. Another meow, this one a little softer. Oh, cheese! I'm so sorry! I rip the tape from the box. Cheese, you gotta forgive me, buddy. Cheese is my 15-pound orange tabby. No wonder the thing was heavier than I expected. He leaps from the box full of random desk clutter and saunters out of my bedroom his tail slapping the doorframe. Cheese, I call once more. I wasn't paying attention, I'm sorry. What can I say? The cat can hold a grudge. Like kitty, like owner. I tap my index finger to the side of my head, hoping I'll remember to give him a few extra treats tonight to make up for my rude behavior. Cheese was our big family Christmas present when I was six years old. I was given the honor of choosing his name and decided to call him Cheese because he looked like cheese? I don't know. I was six, okay? In hindsight, I should have named him after my favorite cheese, Havarti. With a sigh, I give up on the tape and fold the flaps of the box over before taking one last glimpse at my room. 
crisp white trim with peach wallpaper and newspaper mag and magazine clippings pinned randomly all over every surface. A few Miss Flora May I advice column classics. Neat pictures of places I can't even believe exist from Dad's National Geographic subscription. And a few strips from the comic section of the Valentine Gazette. I still remember painting the trim with Mom and Dad all the way and and the way Mom squealed when Dad ran a wet paintbrush down her back. I sort of think I get what adults mean when they say, if these walls could talk. Let's be real, though. The thought of talking walls spooks me out big time. As I sit backward at the front door of the house, the screen door creaks as it shuts behind me. Goodbye, home, I whisper mournfully. A tad dramatic, don't you think, calls Oscar. I whirl around. Just wanted to make sure you didn't need any more help. He stands on the sidewalk. Didn't mean to interrupt your big moment. I huff, blowing my thick black bangs into the air. I wasn't having a moment. I look back at the house. A red brick one story with white trim and a bright blue door. Mom's edition. Only slightly different from every other house on the block, except Miss Flora Mays. Okay, maybe I was. And the Academy Award goes to Sweet P. DeMarco. I look off into the distance. I'd like to thank the little people. And by little people, I mean my best friend, Oscar. My Academy Award is the most exciting thing to ever happen to him. So let's have a moment of silence for how sad that is. Har har, he says. You know I'm the talent in this relationship. I laugh. If you're the talent, I'm the brains. He swings the gate open for me. Well, let's get a move on. I'm starved. And I was promised pizza in exchange for physical labor. Don't pretend like you wouldn't have done it for free. I say, walking through the gate. You love me. I'm your best friend. He laughs dryly. You're my only real friend. He points to Cheese sitting in the window. Did you hear that, Cheese? I'm her best friend. That gets a real laugh out of me. One time when Oscar was spending the night, Cheese fell asleep on his face. Oscar woke up sneezing every five seconds. I explained to him that it was a sign of affection, but Oscar who's just a little bit allergic to just about everything, swore that Cheese had a jealous vendetta against him. Outside of Cheese, though, Oscar is my best friend, and I'm his. But since my parents announced their divorce, or as my mom called it, their mindful division, he's been there every step of the way, and somehow it's brought us even closer. We walk in silence past Miss Flora May's house, where we can see her sitting in her sunroom on her typewriter, watching us over the top of her gold reading glasses. Her long silver hair is wrapped into a bun on the top of her head, and her white skin is soft with wrinkles that I used to always want to trace with my finger when I was little. Miss Flora May's house is the only two-story house on the block. A long time ago, it was a pure white with black shutters, but now it's a little dingy with graying edges and chipping paint. The big wraparound porch and the second floor balcony are still a pretty incredible sight. But I guess people figured out that scientists weren't lying when they say heat rises, because out here in Valentine, Texas, where it looks like someone just plopped our town down in the middle of a desert, no one really messes with tall buildings unless they have to. So Miss Flora May owns one of the few two-story houses on this side of town, which was mostly built up in the last 50 or 60 years. Oscar looks away quickly, careful not to make eye contact with my neighbor. She's not going to put a curse on you, I tell him. He shakes his head. That lady knows everyone's dirt. She's like your mom, except your mom actually has to keep everyone's secrets. It's her job. But people just write Miss Flora May and dump out all their feelings for her advice column. She's bound to know something awful about everyone in this town. He's right. Mom's obligated to keep secrets in a way Miss Flora May isn't. Mom calls it doctor-patient confidentiality. Heck, even when someone says hi to her at the grocery store, and I try to nose around to find out if they're even a client of hers, she winks and says something about everyone knowing everyone in this town. Well, you've never written to Miss Flora May, I tell him, so you've got nothing to worry about, unless there's something you're not telling me. He rolls his eyes. 
trust me, I'm not that desperate. His reaction makes me clam up. I've written Miss Flora May three times in my life, and not once has she ever written back. It's the kind of thing I try to push to the farthest corner of my brain, along with every other unanswered question I have. Dutifully, Oscar opens the gate to the house just on the other side of Miss Flora May's, and I trudge up the steps to my dad standing in the doorway. This house was only empty for two weeks after the Cordova family moved out before mom came up with her genius idea for dad to live on the same street as us. For the last four months, dad lived in the El Cosmico Hotel in a room with two double beds so that I could come over and stay with him. During the day, the El Cosmico is a pretty rundown place. But at night, when it was harder to see the dust and dead roly-polies in the windowsill, I actually sort of liked sitting out by the pool with Dad under the glow of the flashing hot pink letters and neon green cactus of the sign. But I know Dad was getting pretty down with motel life and not having a real kitchen to cook in. It's a big night, Dad says. First night in the new house. He throws his arms up, gesturing to the house behind him. Not too shabby, huh, sweet pea? And I've got some curry chicken pot pie in the oven. Dad pushes his fingers through his hair. Mom used to call it one of his nervous tics, fidgeting with his hair. I'm white, like both my parents, but like Dad, I've got an olivey undertone and I have the same black hair as he does. It's wiry and thick, like his bushy eyebrows too, which it looks like he passed on to me. I give the tiny porch one good look, trying my best to give this place a chance. The only thing that makes this house feel more like home than Mom's place as Dad's beat-up work truck out front. A black pickup with a bed full of scaffolding and painting supplies. Same street, new house. I even painted the door to match, he points out. And sure as heck he did. I was thinking we'd get a porch swing, just like Mom's, I say flatly. I shake my head and point to the door. You got the wrong shade of blue. I feel immediately bad as I turn to Oscar and say, let's go. Sometimes Oscar says the wrong things at the wrong times, but right now he's got my back and follows me into my room in my second new home. And because he's a true best friend, he even slams my bedroom door for me because my hands are full. <laughs>